In a few villages of eastern India, a large community of silk rarers is learning to dream again. An ancient tradition is slowly reviving. A new livelihood has ended the days of chronic poverty. In the forest, the beautiful green caterpillar is spinning silk. But this time, a little differently. Thanks to a small team of professionals for thinking out of the box, a new silk route has emerged across the states of Jharkhand and Bihar. Driving through the rough terrain of the country's hinterland is a regular feature of Shamshad and Prabhakar's life. It's a part of their vocation. They work with Pradhan, a voluntary organization that spreads across some of the remotest pockets of the country, helping poor villagers improve their livelihoods. Jawar, Didi. Jawar, Shamshad, along with a team of professionals, works in Jharkhand. Over the last two decades, they have been engaged in promoting livelihoods around Tassa Seri culture in this region. India is able to meet barely 60% of the demand for Tassa silk. However, when Pradhan started work in this sector, it found no takers among the traditional rearing families. The tradition was long dead and buried. Except for some tribal families like those of Shamlal Baske. He lives near the forest and has been rearing silkworms all his life. Every year, as soon as he is through with transplanting paddy in the fields, Shamlal and his wife start the preparations for producing tasar cocoons. This fascinating process spans the entire life cycle of a silkworm. To begin with, Shamlal hunts for seed cocoons in the forest, brings them home and hangs them in garlands. In a few days, the adult moths break through the cocoons. The male and female moths meet. And then the female moths lay heaps of eggs. Soon, tiny silkworms come out of the eggs. And in a few days, they rapidly grow into big caterpillars. The caterpillars then spin a cocoon around their body. These cocoons are harvested by the rarers and sold to reelers or weavers who extract silk yarn from it. Shamlal has to often take a loan to buy seed cocoons from the local market. After the moths emerge from the cocoons, he identifies the female moths that have mated and puts them into leaf bags to lay eggs. After a week when he reopens the bags, the female moths are dead, but they have left behind several young ones. Shamlal takes the bags to the forest to hang them on the trees of Asan or Arjuna. Over the next few days, he eagerly waits for the tiny silkworms to turn into cocoons. But in the end, he's left disappointed. Like the earlier years, his crop failed yet again. Thousands of rarers like Shamlal eventually gave up sericulture because of never-ending losses. The reason was simple. The rarers followed the traditional and unscientific method of rearing. Mostly, their worms were diseased and died before shaping into cocoons. The rarers attributed the loss to the fury of the forest god. Often, it left them with deep debts. Through its interaction with the community, 
Pradhan figured that if the sector had to be revived, the availability of good quality tusser eggs must be the first step. This was the starting point of a strategy that completely transformed the traditional way of rearing into a modern and scientific one and eventually changed the lives of thousands of poor families. It's the month of July in Inaravaran village. The mercury has crossed 40 degrees. The earth is parched and the sky restless. Eventually, the sweltering heat gives way to the monsoon showers. The villagers get ready to sow paddy in their fields. But some like Sukhu are gearing up for another vocation. It's the start of the rearing season and he must please the forest god to get a good harvest. Every year during this period, Sukhu and his family shift base to the jungle. The Tassa moth breeds two generations in a year. Sukhu works as a seed crop rarer. He produces cocoons in the first cycle that occurs during the monsoon. He sells his stock of cocoons to Anil, who runs a grainage in the village. Here, Anil uses the seed cocoons to produce large volumes of tusser eggs, also known as DFLs or disease-free layings. Anil sells the DFLs to commercial rarers like Betka. He produces cocoons during the second cycle that occurs after the monsoons. This cycle produces cocoons on a large scale which are sold to the weavers who make silk yarn from it. Sukhu is a highly skilled rarer. He has been especially trained to produce the best quality seed cocoons that are free from all diseases. As a seed crop rarer, Sukhu has to practice a lot more care and discipline than an ordinary rarer. These days, his small piece of forest is home to thousands of tiny silkworms. They can be seen munching the tender leaves just about any hour of the day. Their mission is to build up enough reserves in their body for the days ahead. During the 40-day life cycle, they grow fast into big caterpillars. But each time they move to the next stage, they go through a painful process of shedding their old skin. While they are growing up, the caterpillars are like an army of hungry soldiers. Thanks to their robust appetite, they rip a tree bare in just a couple of days. Suku has to constantly shift them to a new tree so that they never remain hungry. The caterpillars are also blind and lack any weapon for self-defense. They are an easy prey for predators like birds and wasps. But under Sukhu's sharp vigil, help is never too far. However, a greater threat comes from invisible enemies like bacteria and viruses. To protect his worms from catching any infection, Sukhu maintains a high level of hygiene in his forest. He frequently applies a disinfectant to the host trees and worms. As the cocoons produced in the first cycle serve as seeds for the second cycle, it is critical that they are completely disease-free. In the last stage of its life cycle, the caterpillar stops eating and gets ready for a hectic work schedule. It secretes a fine filament of protein-rich saliva. For the next 8 to 10 days, without taking a break, 
the worm spins a cocoon around its body. The sun-broken filament is nothing else but silk, which is often as long as one and a half kilometers. By the end of the 40 days, the worm quietly retires from the buzzing forest life into its cocoon. It's time to catch a long nap. A week later, the cocoons are ready to be harvested. Sukhu's perseverance has paid off. Nearly all his worms have turned into good quality cocoons. He will now sell them to a local drainage in the village. Over the next one month, the caterpillar quietly hibernates inside its cocoon. And then, one evening, when the air is hot and humid, it becomes restless to emerge. It secretes an enzyme to soften the cocoon and comes out in the late hours of the night. But now, it looks different. The green caterpillar has turned into a beautiful moth. This time, it has emerged not in the wilderness of the forest, but inside a safe drainage in the village. And it is not alone. Many others have broken out of their shell tonight. After the moths emerge, they take a few hours to settle and then perform the most important task of their lives. They mate. In the traditional form of rearing, the moths would have flown tens of kilometers through the jungle to search for a mate. But here in the drainage, they needn't look far. The female moth is yellow in color and it mates only once in her lifetime. The sole purpose of her existence is to fertilize the eggs that she has been carrying within. The male, which is brown in color, is known to mate more than twice. But soon after, he dies. It's the beginning of the end for him. Anil is a young tribal who owns this drainage. Every year, he buys his stock of seed cocoons from rarers like Sukhu and uses them to produce high-quality tusser eggs. Today is a busy day for him. The moths have mated last night and he has to decouple the pairs today. Each female moth is put into a plastic box where she will lay her eggs. By putting them separately, Anil is able to prevent any diseased eggs from getting mixed with the healthy ones. Over the next three days, the female moths lay eggs under cool and humid conditions. As soon as they finish, each female moth is checked under the microscope to detect the incidence of any disease. With practice, Anil is quick to spot the infected moth. These moths, along with their eggs, are burnt immediately. In Pradhan's model, the drainage is a critical part of the process. By segregating the disease-free eggs and eliminating the infected ones, the drainage checks the spread of bacteria and viruses that used to wipe off the entire crop in the traditional form of rearing. Microscopic examination is a great opportunity here. कि एक जो लेमेन जिसके लिए हमको साइंस ग्रेजुएट चाहिए वो हम लोगों ने इतना पक्का कर दिया इनके सम्मिलित प्रयास से कि वो तीन दिन के अंदर उसको माइक्रोस्कोप को खोल भी लेते हैं लगा भी लेते हैं 
हैफ एजड भी कर देने के बाद उसको सही कर लेते हैं स्वयं सलाइड भी बनाते हैं स्मेयर तैयार करके और वो जो बीमारी जो बतलाया गया है कि यही बीमारी तुम्हारे लिए सबसे घातक है इसको पहचानो और इस तितली को अलग कर दो to rid them of any remaining infection and then left to dry under shade after passing through a series of checks these high quality tusser eggs are sold to the commercial rarers as disease free layings by training and motivating hundreds of village youth to become granite owners pradhan has given them a new confidence and a lucrative source of income pardan nahi aane se pehle mere paas na to packet mein 5 10 rupees rehta tha bilkul nahi tha wo bhi apne gaon mere gaon se puchai jane ke liye packet mein 5 rupees rehna bhi mushkil tha jab se mere gaon mein pardan aaya jiske ghar mein pual ka chawani tha to kapda bana liye jiske ghar mein cycle tha motorcycle ho gaya jiske ghar mein bela nahi tha bela khareed liye aaj pardan aane ke baad bahut kuch गांव में विकास हुआ और बदलाव हुआ बेटका इज अ कमर्शियल रेयर हु हैज बीन बाइंग डीएफएलस फ्रॉम अनिल सिंस 2 इयर्स टुडे ही हैज रीगेंड फेथ इन रेयरिंग सिल्क वर्म्स द अवेलेबिलिटी ऑफ गुड क्वालिटी डीएफएलस इन द विलेज हैज मेड अ बिग डिफरेंस होगा मच्छरदानी भी प्लांटेशन में भी लगाना पड़ेगा उसके लिए तो आसानी है क्योंकि एक ही समान गाछ रहता है सब ठीक But the more crucial support has come from Pradhan's training that has completely changed his traditional way of rearing. During the several classroom sessions he attended, Betka unlearned and relearned many things. ठीक है काला रंग का कीड़ा होता है बहुत छोटा चीटियों की तरह होता है ठीक है निकालने के समय वो पहले अंडा का ऊपर वाला जो छिलका टो होता है वो छिलका को खाता है ठीक है पहले खाना वहाँ से मिलता है फिर जाकर वो पत्ते को चूसता है ही बिगिन्स बाय सेटिंग अप अ ह्यूज नेट ओवर हिज प्लांटेशन इन अ फ्यू डेज दिस शेल्टर विल बी होम टू न्यू बॉर्न वर्म्स दिस यूनिक मेथड इंट्रोड्यूस्ड बाय प्रधान हैज मेड अ बिग डिफरेंस इन इंप्रूविंग द सर्वाइवल रेट ऑफ टाइनी वर्म्स द नेट प्रोटेक्ट्स देम फ्रॉम प्रेडिटर्स एंड आल्सो फ्रॉम हार्श वेदर Betka also disinfects this area to guard the worms from catching any infection. Back home, the moment has arrived. Betka is anxious as he is expecting a new life to take birth. Slowly, a tiny worm breaks through the shell. and comes out into a new world very soon the entire pack of dfls gets hatched like all newborns the tiny worms are eager to explore the world but first they are hungry and so they eat a calcium rich meal of their own egg shells Betka has also arranged for fresh leaves to make the little ones feel at home. As he learned during his training, he quickly transfers the worms to their natural habitat, the Arjuna trees. <laughs> 